Thank you, Jerry and Ben and my mentor, Elmer Towns. Uh, I love this university. Uh, just the day before yesterday, I was in near the Syrian border. Syria is the greatest humanitarian crisis in the world right now, with 70,000 deaths, over a million refugees, and if you turn on the news, you'll, you would never know it's going on. While I was there, I visited a refugee camp with 80,000 people living in tents, with miles and miles of tents as far as I could see. I talked with two teenage girls who told me they were forced to watch their mothers being gang raped. I talked to boys who told me they saw their fathers being mutilated by the Syrian army. A man came up to me carrying a, a baby. He was shouting and carrying this tiny baby in his arms and he stopped me and tried to give me the baby. He told me that her mother had died and for the past several weeks, he had endured the cold of the snow and the rain, living in a tent. He said there was very little to eat. And he told me he was afraid the baby was going to die. I thought, dear God, this man has lost his wife. Now he's about to lose his daughter. And he would rather give her to me, a complete stranger, than to risk her dying in his arms. And I connected this father with one of our partners and told him that we would do all that we could to help. I silently prayed, and then I had to turn and walk away with tears in my eyes. And this morning, in your global focus, I ask Liberty University to please focus on Syria. It's time for this insanity to stop. How many more have to suffer and die before we cry out with our loudest voice, enough? The suffering I saw the last few days Reminded me of a time a few years ago when I saw poverty of a different kind, hopelessness. Uh, my alarm went off at 4.30 in the morning that morning, way, way too early for my exhausted, jet-lagged body. But this was one morning I didn't want to sleep in. I wanted to be on the Ganges River by dawn. I had traveled halfway around the world to India, one of the most spiritually dark places in all of the world. I walked through the small deserted streets near the river that morning. It was still dark. I stumbled over people who had spent the night sleeping on the streets. Beggars were already waiting with their hands out for food or for money or anything else they could get. And the sight of filthy, starving children begging for food was hard to bear. Many of those children were deformed. Their struggle was heartbreaking. And by the time I arrived at the riverbank, thousands of people were already in the water washing themselves in that filthy, dirty water. Hindus believe that if they ceremoniously bathe in the most holy of all rivers, that their sins will be washed away. But the waters of the Ganges River are polluted with raw sewage and trash and animal carcasses and dead bodies and the ashes of cremated human beings. Hundreds of bodies are burned every day in Varnasi, and their ashes are sprinkled in the river because the Hindus believe that this allows their loved ones direct access to heaven. I saw piles of wood and smoke from the burning bodies, 
family members weeping over the loss of their loved ones. No hope. Everywhere I looked, I saw people waist deep in that filthy water. They would pour the water over their heads. Some would actually drink that polluted water. They were drinking disease. Some used brass pots to scoop up the water and hold it above their heads and then ceremoniously pour it out over their head. Many folded their hands and prayed. Hindu holy men with painted faces and dressed in bright orange clothing chanted while music played in the background. And all of these activities were sincere acts of worship, but they were sincerely wrong. It was an overwhelming sight. I glanced around and my heart broke at the masses of humanity, diseased, blind, crippled, poor, destitute. I realized that no one had ever told them that it isn't the dirty, polluted waters of the Ganges River that will wash away their sins, but only the shed blood of Jesus Christ will forgive them of their sins. But they'd never heard of Jesus. They'd never heard the good news, not even one time. They were totally unreached. And I ask God to open their eyes. I ask God to open my eyes. It was an incredible experience that I've never forgotten. And once every 12 years, Hindus make a religious pilgrimage to the Ganges River that's called Kumela. It's happening again this year. In fact, it's happening right now at this very moment. For 55 days, are you ready for this? 80 million Hindu pilgrims will descend on the Ganges River in Allahabad. It's the largest gathering of humanity on earth, and they will all ceremoniously bathe in the Ganges River. That means today, right now, there are millions and millions of Hindus standing waist deep in that river trying to find atonement for their sins. And this mass gathering reminds me of the famous last words of Jesus Christ. It's really why we're having this global focus week because of those famous last words of Jesus Christ. They say that a person's last words are important to be remembered, sometimes prophetic. The last words of Jesus are recorded in Scripture because they're to be remembered and obeyed. They're not optional. In Acts chapter 1, Verse 8, we read those famous last words when Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from his sight. And then in the message translation, it reads, these were his last words. This was not something that Jesus forgot to tell his disciples. And now he's frantically running around trying to squeeze it in before he departed. This was the plan of God from the beginning of mankind. This was why Jesus came to earth. This was why he performed the miracles. This was why he died on the cross. This was why he rose from the dead. It was the most important thing that he wanted them to remember, that our impact is to be both locally and globally, simultaneously, to the ends of the earth, to the end of the age. In other words, 
Jesus has commanded us to go to every distinct ethnic group on the face of the earth and make disciples, Christ followers. He wants everyone to have the opportunity to hear the gospel at least once in his lifetime. Jesus would not have commanded us to make disciples if it were impossible. Jesus would not have commanded us to make disciples if he did not intend for us to obey. God has given us the technology. He's given us the manpower. He's given us the resources. The Great Commission is not an impossible mission. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary statesman to China from a century ago said, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered, but rather a command to be obeyed. Oswald J. Smith was the pastor of the People's Church in Toronto, Canada. A generation ago, he preached a now famous sermon entitled, Why Should Anyone Hear the Gospel Twice? until everyone has heard the gospel at least once. And in this famous sermon, he illustrated this point by asking his hearers to imagine what it would have been like if we had been present with Jesus the day he performed the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. He said, imagine if we had been the disciples that served the bread and fishes to the multitudes. He said, imagine if Jesus had filled our baskets and we went out and served all those thousands of people, but we only served bread and fish to the first few rows. And we came back and had our baskets refilled, but only served bread and fish a second time to the first few rows. And we came back and had our baskets refilled, but only served bread and fish again the third time to the first few rows. He said it wouldn't be long until the people in the back rows would begin to complain and would say, wait a minute, that's not fair. Send someone to the back rows. And I say to you, here in the West, where we hear the gospel over and over and over, and we have gospel music and gospel television and gospel preaching and we've heard the gospel so many times we're immune to it because we're on the front rows but there are millions yes billions of people today that are living on the back rows and they've never heard the gospel not even one time we must each answer the question, where do I fit into God's plan to evangelize the unreached peoples of the world? Because we must get the gospel to the back rows. Some of you may be thinking, well, I'm not a missions major. I'm not going to be a pastor or a church planter. That's okay for you. How can God use me to fulfill the Great Commission? We desperately need everyone on the front lines in every profession and on every corner of the globe. Don't be afraid to pursue the passion and the calling that God has uniquely given you. Jesus' disciples were tax collectors, fishermen. Some were skilled in other professions, but that did not stop them from going to the back rows. A neighbor of mine is a doctor. He saves lives for a living. But he understands that he's still responsible for reaching the nations, and he uses his vacation time to take his family to Guatemala every summer to share the gospel. My friend Kevin Foster is a businessman here in Lynchburg, but he's using his life in such a way that he's reaching the world. He's raised hundreds of thousands of dollars through golf tournaments to build clean water wells for impoverished communities, meeting the, the simple physical needs 
God is allowing Kevin to share the gospel with people who had never otherwise heard. And he's a businessman. He's a building contractor. My friend Tony Brown lives here in Lynchburg. He's the global vice president for J. Crew. And every year he takes his family to Central America to distribute J. Crew clothing to the orphans, the best dressed orphans in the world. <laughs> and while he's there, he and his family physically build houses and church buildings for people who will ultimately become followers of Jesus Christ. He's a businessman. This university was founded on a vision that Dr. Jerry Falwell had to raise up champions for Christ in every single area of academic discipline. He had a vision to empower a generation of students to be strategically positioned to share the gospel with the world, to reach the back rows filled with people who are waiting to hear about the hope of Jesus Christ. And I was one of those students I caught Jerry Falwell's vision. The reason you are sitting here this morning is because of Jerry Falwell's vision. And I pray that today you will catch that vision also. Each one of us must ask ourselves, am I using what God has given me, my time, my talent, my resources to show the world who Jesus Christ is. And if I'm not the one on the front lines of the back rows, how am I supporting and advocating for people who are? I believe that every single student at Liberty should seriously consider and commit to going on a short-term missions trip sometime during your four years or five years, or six years here at Liberty. Some of you may have your eyes open to a calling that God wants to place on your life. Some of you may be pushed out of your comfort zone more than you ever have before. You may see firsthand why the situation is so desperate and why every single one of us must be actively involved in reaching the lost. John Dupin, the pastor of Brentwood Church right here in Lynchburg, said it, he said it best a few Sundays ago. He challenged his church to go on short-term mission trips and said, if you're not buying a ticket for yourself, you should be buying someone else's ticket. That's what it means to reach the back rows. Could we be the generation that God uses to share the gospel with these unreached peoples. We have no choice but to believe we are. We must believe that God can use us to help reach them regardless of our career. So how are we doing? Well, today there's good news and there's bad news. First, the good news. 35,000 new churches are opening every week worldwide. That's good news. In 1950, when the missionaries were expelled, there were only one million Christians in China. Today, there are an estimated 100 million Christians in China. That's good news. Our ministry in the past few years has printed and distributed over one million Chinese Bibles. Now we are putting the Bible on a USB drive and university students are taking it from computer to computer to computer and the Word of God is going viral in the nation of mainland China. In 1900, the country of Korea had no Protestant churches whatsoever. It was deemed impossible to penetrate. Today, Korea is nearly 30% Christian with thousands of churches in the city of Seoul alone, including five of the 10 largest churches in the world. 
That's good news. In Indonesia, where Dr. Towns just preached, the percentage of Christians is so high that the government will not print the statistics, which are probably nearing 25% of the population. The last accurate tally of Indonesian Christians revealed that more than 2 million Muslims had turned to Jesus Christ. That's good news. More Muslims have come to Christ in the country of Iran since 1980 than the past 1,000 years combined. That's good news. But there's another side of the coin. There's the bad news. Nearly half the world's population, almost 3 billion people, have never heard the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not even one time in their life. That's bad news. 4.7 billion people, 70% of the world's population, watched the 2008 Beijing Olympics on television. That means there are more people alive who know what happened in Beijing four years ago than know what happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. That's bad news. Of the 17,000 people groups in the world, nearly 7,000 do not have a single church or gospel witness of any kind. That means 41% of all the people groups in the world are unreached 1,500 of these groups are unengaged, which means there's no current missionary work or evangelism taking place at all. That's bad news. Recently, I read that every day, 70,000 people die without ever hearing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That means during this meeting, 3,000 people died and went into eternity without ever hearing the gospel once. I saw a statistic that would help put all of this in perspective. It said if we could shrink the world's population of over 7 billion to a village of precisely 100 people with all existing human ratios Remaining the same, the village would look like this. There would be 60 Asians, 11 Europeans, 14 from the Western Hemisphere, including North and South America, and 15 from Africa. 51 would be female, 49 would be male, 82 would be non-white, while only 18 would be white. 68 would be non-Christian, while only 32 would be Christian. 80 would live in substandard housing. 20 would be unable to read. 14 would suffer from malnutrition. One would be near death. One would be near birth. Only six would have a college education. And are you ready for this? Nearly half of the entire village's wealth would be in the hands of only five people. And all five would be citizens of the United States. In light of this, I say to us this morning, we must take our role in world evangelism seriously. We must take the Great Commission seriously. We must take the famous last words of Jesus Christ seriously to the ends of the earth to the end of the age. And we must make unreached and unengaged people groups a priority. We must focus on the back rows. One of the pastors we partner with in Nepal near the Tibetan border had to flee in the middle of the night with 52 orphan children because the terrorists said, if you're here in the morning, we'll kill you. In Vietnam, 
One of our partners is a 35-year-old pastor. He was beaten many times as well as his wife. The authorities burned down his house because he would not forsake Christ. He built a tent and they burned that down also. Recently, his wife was once again severely beaten. She was pregnant. She lost her baby. One of our partners is a 34-year-old woman evangelist and church planter. One day, the police publicly humiliated her by tearing off her shirt and parading her through the streets, and she stood in that public gathering with her hands tied behind her back, and she proclaimed, I live for Jesus Christ, and if I die, I die for Jesus Christ. And I say this morning, if Christ's followers in Nepal, in China, in Vietnam, and this story that we've heard this morning are willing to die for Jesus Christ, surely we should be willing to get involved and live for Jesus Christ. K.G. McMillan said, The difference between an ordinary Christian and a deeply committed one is that the ordinary Christian gets emotional while the deeply committed one gets involved. So I challenge you, Liberty University, to take the famous last words of Jesus Christ very seriously. And I challenge you to go get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.